Baas, Anton Baas, we met in the Netherlands, in Groningen, because he is um, the holder of the first European Chair for History, uh, Ethics and Human Rights. And we are very proud to have a, a chair in, at the University of Groningen, where Anton Baas works as a professor for contemporary history. He is not a rich person. He is uh, originating from Belgium, where he also studied at the University of Kent. I don't know if the, the Dutch colleagues will know about the University of Kent because it's famous of uh, Professor Piren, who uh, worked there in the time that Anton de Waas uh, studied there. No, not then, not. He was already dead. He was already dead, yes, of course. My dates. <laughs> He yes, he did. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to mention him. And Anton Baats, he uh, is the founder of uh, a network of concert historians. And he uh, also published uh, a lot of books and articles about um, well, uh, responsible history and the freedom of historical thought. And well, I think we are very proud to have him here for the uh, keynote speech of today. And I would like to hand over the microphone to Anton Baas. Dear Maria, dear friends of Euro Clio, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. Thank you for this cordial invitation. First, I want to correct something uh, from the introduction. Henri Piven died in 1935. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I was born two decades later. <laughs> But I wish I could have seen him at work. Today I will discuss the relationship between democracy and historical right. There are at least three ways to do this. First, by identifying broad historical trends that affected the emergence and development of the political system known as democracy and the place of historical writing in these trends. Second, by picking some case studies and then try to infer general lessons from them. And finally, by discussing ideal types of both democracy and historical writing from a theoretical perspective. I chose the third avenue in full awareness that constitutes a limited approach to an almost inexhaustible topic with as many interpretations as scholars proposing them. Inevitably, my theoretical reflection will contain much speculation, but I hope not without a firm foundation in logical and where possible and applicable evidence-based arguments. Before entering then into a discussion of the relationship between the ideal types of democracy and historical writing, let me briefly try to define both concepts. As for the notion of historical writing, I will look at an ideal type which I summarily call responsible historical writing. Historical writing is responsible <coughs> when it is characterized by what <coughs> Bernard Williams, the moral philosopher, identified as the two basic virtues of truth, 
namely accuracy to find truth and sincerity to tell the truth. The ideal type of democracy is rooted in the human rights system. This needs a little bit more explanation. It is well known that the reading documents on human rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the covenants derived from it advocate a democratic society as the best political system to protect human rights. In the same vein, the United Nations defined a democratic society as a society that recognizes and respects the human rights set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This definition, that democracy is a political system that protects and respects human rights, simple as it seems, is strong in fact because it requires any conception of democracy to be infused with a demanding human rights-oriented application of the rule of law. <coughs> Such a definition is an ideal, and strictly speaking, no state in the world lives up to it. In any case, this aspiration to closely link human rights and democracy has its roots in history. Both ideas emerged as the result of the so-called democratic revolutions of the late 18th century. But their mutual relationship has remained stern until perhaps the recent collapse of Latin American dictatorships and the end of communism and the Cold War. In the leading document on democracy, the so-called Universal Declaration on Democracy, the interconnectedness between democracy and human rights <coughs> is as pervasive <coughs> as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Whereas the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stipulates the core principles of democracy only, the Universal Declaration on Democracy also highlights several of its conditions. These conditions include freedom of expression, accountability, and transparency. And that declaration also adds, I quote, a sustained state of democracy requires a democratic climate and culture constantly nurtured by education and by other vectors of culture and information. Insight into the determinants of democracy is important for the problem I want to address here, the relationship between democracy and historical writing. My strategy is to first explore the general relationship between historical awareness and democracy. Then, I shall speak about the relationship between democracy and historical writing itself, and try to find out whether democracy is a condition for science in general and for responsible historical writing in particular. And I will also investigate the reverse relationship by testing four claims, which I shall call the zero thesis, the mirror thesis, the amplifier thesis, and the midwife thesis. And I will explain this in a minute. The aim, my aim is to discover how historical writing helps foment a democratic culture. Throughout history, scores of societies 
have displayed historical awareness. That is, a shared sensitivity towards the past as expressed in collective, uh, collective memory and historical knowledge. The presence of historical awareness since time immemorial is important here in two respects. It means, first, that historical awareness is much older than democracy. Long before modern democracies came into existence, roughly in the 19th century, societies possessed historical awareness, although it was often limited to elite groups. There are many theories about the conditions that arouse historical awareness. And among the strongest of these theories are those that tell us that collective experiences of shame and pride are reliable predictors of increases in historical awareness. When the identity of a people is threatened by defeat in war and by violent domination, when it is jeopardized by loss of roots, or conversely, when it is boosted by freshly gained autonomy, <coughs> historical awareness is fueled. In particular, the collective memory of historical injustice can stretch back centuries. My second point is less straightforward. Given comparable levels of social economic development, Historical awareness is not necessarily stronger in democracies than in non-democratic regimes. Non-democratic rule cannot draw sufficient legitimation for its power from elections and laws. Therefore, it must seek legitimation elsewhere, often in an ideology that turns the past into its instrument. Non-democratic rule usually imposes an official memory and tries to crush memories that challenge it. Many tyrants, therefore, show a keen interest in history. Their eagerness to censor history is proof a contrario of their historical awareness. In contrast, dissidents may refute the dictator's historical lies, even at the cost of persecution. In addition, the weak credibility of the official versions of history directs the collective curiosity to historical taboos substitutes for historical writing, for censored historical writing, may rapidly emerge. In short, historical awareness can flourish under non-democratic regimes. In many ways, despite the fact that public expression of its dissident forms is systematically forbidden. In their turn, democracies can also draw part of their legitimacy from the past by presenting themselves as a continuation of democratic precedents. In addition, in democracies with a multi-ethnic character, recollection of the past may bring comfort to alienated minorities. History education at school is a generalized feature in democracies. But in itself, it is not necessarily a reliable indicator of the levels of historical awareness among the adult population of a generation later. And information and debate <coughs> fed by the media or by cultural outlets do not always make up for this. 
It is even striking how complaints about low levels of historical awareness abound in many democracies. It may be that these alleged low levels are relative because of our misplaced inclination to compare entire populations <coughs> in democracies with just some elite groups in non-democratic regimes. If that is true, then the alleged low levels of historical awareness in democracies are still higher than the alleged high levels of historical awareness under non-democratic rule. Even if historical awareness in democracies is not low, however, or not in decline, it need not automatically strengthen democratic values only a democratic historical uh, awareness will strengthen democratic values. The in-between case of new or restored democracies may seem special from a transitional justice point of view, but it is not special from the perspective of historical awareness theory. In the last decades, the experience of new or restored democracies with truth commissions and tribunals repeatedly demonstrated that during a short period immediately after the downfall of non-democratic regimes or the end of armed conflicts, there is a widespread fever to know the facts of what exactly happened with the victims of repression and violence. In addition, large sectors of society want to know how and why violence was organized and who were those responsible. Impressed by the powerful drive of new and restored <coughs> democracies for knowledge about past suffering, the United Nations developed a so-called right to the truth. This is a new human right that stipulates that victims of human rights violations and their families and society in its entirety have the right to know the truth about the circumstances in which the violence generated by the conflict took place and in the event